media because if it weren't for the hardworking people at wikimedia.com and the photographers and artists that contribute to it, every single slide would look exactly like this. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm Lori Barfield. I am a con organizer for uh, the Southern California Linux Expo and a co-founder of ShellCon. And I'm a seasoned hiring manager. I'm giving this talk today because I've recareered twice in my life already, and right now I'm in the process of recareering into the information security industry myself, and I'm learning a lot about it, and I want to share my experience with you. So part of the challenge with recareering anywhere in the IT industry is our HR practices and our processes. Um, it cuts both ways. The HR people in our lives want to do their jobs as efficiently and as accurately as possible. So the practices come across as notoriously cookie cutter, um, especially hiring. Um, they, uh, when a hiring manager creates an open job requisition, they'll give a list of requirements and typically those go in every job posting. And as a candidate, if you want to get noticed, you're going to have to beat those job requirements. Uh, in doing things cookie cutter like this, where jobs all have very conventional requirements and, and uh, the process is streamlined, uh, it's very efficient, just like an engineer would do his job efficiently. Uh, it's also low risk. Uh, if you're a candidate and you can check off eight out of ten of the requirements, pretty good chance that if they hire you, you're not going to quit in a week. Uh, on the other hand, it's a self-defeating kind of process. Because the best teams in IT, every engineering team that's a really good one, is going to be a diverse team. And I'm not talking about the color of your skin or your gender or anything like that. I'm talking about the most diverse teams are teams where the engineers have very different backgrounds. If everybody went to the same school, got the same degree, and had the same work experience, you would not have robust architecture. So changing career trajectory, I. Is there, how many people are trying to re-career? How many people are making a change? Okay, so th there's like three levels of magnitude. Okay, so we've all, we've, it, security may be a brand new industry for you, maybe you're an undertaker. So <laughs> your job, your current job won't have much to do with security, you got a lot of learning to do. Um, or it might just be a new vertical, maybe you're doing security in the Hollywood industry and you'd like to go uh, work for a pharmaceutical company. Those will use maybe a lot of the same skills, but they'll want different work experience and different uh, certifications. The third kind of recareering is something you see all the time, and that's where you're just changing roles. So if you're in a company and you're an engineer, but you'd like to go, uh, let's say you're a network engineer, and you'd like to go be, um, do security full time. It's not a really big stretch. As a matter of fact, most HR organizations are pretty competent at helping you recareer into that new role. So I wanted to give you some the, the benefit of some statistics because I think you're making a good choice to go in the security industry. Um, this is research that Forbes did, uh, a couple of graphics, um, and this just came out last year. Um, I don't know, if, do you put the ISACA? Uh, is this, we call that ISACA? Okay, well, we'll pretend this was called ISACA. Uh, they're a nonprofit information security advocacy group and they do training and they do professional certifications. We've heard of most of them. Um, and they reported that there's going to be a global shortage of 2 million cybersecurity professionals by 2019. That's by next year, there's going to be 2 million jobs out there without bodies to fill them. Um, CyberSeq is a security jobs and education site. They reported there's 40,000 jobs for information security analysts alone that are unfilled. And employers are struggling to fill 200,000 other security related jobs. Um, and Indeed reported, uh, Indeed.com, it's a job hunting website, it's free for most people. Uh, they say that for every 10 cybersecurity job ads, only seven people click on one of them. And that is, the, and the, out of those seven people, very few actually even apply for the roles. So there is a huge demand out there. The graphic on the right is, The graphic on the right is a little bit older, and it's not related research. It's just something I found that breaks down jobs in the United States by uh, industry. 
So it makes sense that if you're going to re-career into security, it'd be good to know where all the jobs are in general in the United States. Almost everything has a computer-related component and a com thus a computer security-related component. And if you look, that yellow one, uh, that is the health in and um, education industry. I'm assuming that they're grouped together because medical research uh, uh, it gets, often gets grouped with, um, with the health industry. Uh, but that's a good quarter of the pie. Uh, and that was kind of eye-opening to me. Uh, the purple is information services. Um, what is the brown? Brown is manufacturing. So why hire Reborn? So um, do we have any hiring managers? Yeah, okay, we got one. Okay, so this is, this is the slide for you. <laughs> because it's a really big challenge in the IT world, unless you work for a very small company, to bring in people that are re-careering from somewhere else. The, remember, the HR processes and procedures are very cookie cutter, um, and people don't like to take a lot of chances. But here's the language that hiring managers can use to justify hiring reborns who have really unconventional qualifications. Um, and you can do this, it works successfully. I, I, I successfully hired uh, reborn, uh, recareering individuals at a public company on a uh, system administration team. This was years ago. Um, and here's the kind of language that works. You, you just need to help your HR department by giving this to them. So, and we have a <laughs> superb HR professional with us. And by the way, the way I organized this talk, I put all the controversial slides in the front. So we're going to cover all the hot stuff, uh, the stuff that she'll probably say, I want to talk to you about that later. Um, and then if, if it turns out that some of the information I'm giving is less useful, we'll skip those slides. And we'll go right to the workshop. Anyway, so here's the, hiring, here's the language for hiring managers that's the secret sauce. Uh, reborns, people that re-career from other professions, they're lower cost during the ramp up, just like any junior would be. Uh, but you're not paying to seize them, season them as a professional. They're coming in with a whole body of training experience that actually is going to inform their new career. And you didn't have to pay for any of that. Uh, they're also a lot more willing to provide formal qualifications. You know what it's like to have a team full of senior engineers and not one of them is willing to go get a CCNA updated. Paying a major bucks, they don't have any time. It takes years to get people to attend classes, and then a lot of times they won't take the test. Whereas those new reborns that are coming in, they're just hot off of all their training, and they're a lot more willing to be the guy on the team that goes and gets the certification. So at least one guy on the team fulfills that need. Um, I'd like to give you an example of how bringing a reborn on a team makes a team better. Um, and it's, it's counterintuitive because you think, well, gee, if everybody had a doctorate that was related to information security, wouldn't that be the best team in the world? No, it wouldn't. And let me explain to you why. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say I have a job rec open for a programming, programming position, um, and I am interviewing a technical writer. So what would you expect from this technical writer when they come to the team? Well, they're going to write really good documentation, right? Not only that, they are going to, the second you hand them a task and, they, and they're going to follow on other people's work, they're going to, the first thing they're going to do when they get a new task is they're going to rewrite that documentation and make it much better. In fact, a technical writer who has experience recurring from another profession is going to be in a, is a, is going to be in a process and procedure mindset that's unparalleled because they will have just come off the exercise of explaining themselves over and over to someone who doesn't have the same context. And that is the perfect person to be working on existing code in a junior role and making upgrades. <clears throat> so the tough to fill positions for the hiring manager in the group and for the video, uh, this, is, this is key. Um, this, is, this is strategic, let's put it that way. So speaking as an executive, uh, this is strategic. Uh, every hiring manager, second level manager, executive has had that one position that they can just never fill. Uh, you advertise it, you're not doing anything wrong. Oops. What did I do? I fell asleep. Hold on a sec. There we go. Thank you. 
So you, every, every manager has had this stubborn position that's just sitting there open. And you might be getting anemic responses to it, but you just can't feel it. And HR is getting frustrated and it's aging out. And it's starting to look bad. It's starting to make you look bad, like nobody wants to work for you. And then eventually you finally get a candidate and you bring them in, you're probably paying them way too much money, but you didn't want to lose them in the negotiation process. And then, so you'll have to deal with the, with the salary problem later. And then they come on the team and for 30 days they're sucking up mentoring cycles and training money. And just about when they're going to start, they quit. Now you have this gap and HR is on your case and now they're going to have to pay 10 to 20% bounty to a headhunter to try to fill that role in a hurry. And if there's money available for that, which there probably is, that's going to come out of a budget. And that budget is a budget that you share with all of your peer group managers in the company. So the next time you get together with your other peer group managers and you're doing budgeting, they're going to say, gee, thanks for sucking up all that recruiting money that we needed for some state-of-the-art technology that we're trying to implement on the product line. This is the kind of role you should target for a reborn. Because they can fulfill the requirements with creative uh, accomplishments. Um, and they're going to stick with it. And they're people that have already proven that they're flexible. So how to re-career. So I've done this two times in my life. Actually, I should probably give you a little background. Uh, I've been an engineer in the aerospace industry, uh, video game industry, and uh, Hollywood industry, all the three large companies. Um, and I've been in leadership roles. Um, in multiple, uh, from team lead to uh, department manager uh, to executive positions here and in Canada. Um, and the companies I've worked for over the years have gone through changes and the industries that they're in have also gone through changes. So I've had to change direction a couple times in my life. And so I want to share with you that process so that you can succeed a lot quicker than I did. <laughs> and I found that there's, there's four steps. The first thing is building up your qualifications. That's kind of obvious, right? <laughs> no one's just going to give you a job. Well, unless there's nepotism involved, no one's just going to give you a job, even if you're not qualified. So what you do while you're still working, the most intuitive thing is you try to find opportunities in your current role. So if you're a network engineer and you want to do security, the next time they're doing a big old Cisco, uh, mass Cisco patch, uh, project, you can get involved in that, right? You try to find ways that you can integrate security work in your day-to-day -day activities and start putting that on your resume. Um, if, uh, if that fails, then you can always try to find casual consulting work. Uh, for this, the, the companies are often a lot very flexible about not needing the requirements. Usually, it's in my experience, you find it through your personal network because there are people that know you. They know that you don't know the stuff, but you'll pick it up. Uh, and that you won't, you won't sign on for something that's too big of a reach. Um, but let's say that fails. Uh, let's say you can't find any work uh, on, the, on your day-to-day -day job and nobody wants to pay you for consulting work. You can always work for free. You can do volunteer work. Um, this is uh, when there was that big earthquake in Haiti a few years ago. Uh, this is how I got some project management work uh, with new technologies I wasn't experienced with. Um, and the, the great thing about volunteer work is that if you work with the disaster uh, preparedness and recovery organizations, they're often under really heavy time constraints. So you've got an earthquake and within 30 days you've got to get people, within 30 days you may have certain goals to spend a certain amount of money. They're just, you just say you can do it. They're not, they're, they're not looking at anybody's resume. Just come in and start getting the work done. Uh, and also you can use LinkedIn. LinkedIn you can, you can search on nonprofits and you can just read the descriptions and try to find candidate companies uh, or candidate organizations. Um, but let's say that fails. Let's say um, you, can't find extra, you can't find this work on the job and you can't even do it for free. What else can you do? Well, you can write a talk and you can speak it a luck. That's another way to prove you understand a technology without ever actually having done the work. But the thing, the trick with that is, is you need to publish those slides and you need to put that link on your resume so that when you're sitting in a job interview talking to your next boss, uh, he or she can can just with a single click confirm what your working knowledge is and what your take is on that technology. <clears throat> now, um, it's probably preaching to the choir here, but open source is another excellent avenue for not only learning a new technology, getting free mentoring, 
Uh, but once again, creating a resource out there on the internet that's public that you can refer to on your resume. And <laughs> open source projects are not, uh, they're not asking for doctorates and they're not checking, they're not checking your, um, they're not checking your resume before they say, oh, okay, get started. Uh, in the security industry, it's very unique that we have creative qualifications because we are so new um, and competitions are very credible. Um, and they are, uh, and, and it's public exposure as well. You don't have to win a competition for it to be meaningful on your resume. Uh, just saying that you participated uh, is usually enough to give you something to talk about because a lot of the times, they, the, um, the competition organizers give the solutions and it's more important to sit there and listen to their process and listen to the solutions uh, than to have sat there for an hour uh, banging your head against the wall. You, there's a lot of learning there. And even if they don't give the solution, just working side by side with other people and then sharing your, your methodology later uh, seasons you as an engineer. Uh, yesterday, during the, the jobs panel that was here, they gave a whole list of online skill builder sites that they're very excited about. I have a couple others. Uh, I can give those to you at the workshop if you're interested. They warned us that the online sites are, are often just tests, uh, but there are some sites that are more tutorials. Uh, of course, when you're building your qualifications, if you can afford it and you have the time, uh, the most conventional qualification of all is a related college degree. And more and more colleges are offering certificate programs. Like UCLA just offered one, I think they want about four grand for it. And it's just a sequence of a few classes and you can take it through their um, extension program. Uh, and what college you pick and, and the schedule and all that, before you get into that, you definitely should look into what your target companies are looking for. Uh, and the last item here, the industry and vendor certifications and training. Once again, yesterday they gave us some good hint, they gave us some very good advice and controversial advice. And I had already asked a few professionals what their favorite certifications were. And this is going to look horrifying. Welcome to Alphabet Soup. I think that they do this to us on purpose so that we accidentally apply for security guard roles at some ball somewhere instead of cybersecurity positions at a Fortune 100 company. Uh, so this is very daunting. Um, and I, these are, this is legitimate data. These are the most popular certifications and people gave me their rationale for it. And here's my message to you about this. Take it from two different directions. If you want to find out if a certi certification is worth your time, go on LinkedIn and search on that certification and the jobs that require it will pop up. If that's a job you're interested in, that might be a good certification for you, especially if it's a target company. You can do the opposite on Google. You Google the jobs that you're interested in and pick out a few job postings that, that look like what you want to do and in your target company. And if those job postings call out these certifications, that's also a good bet. Second step in how to re-career, avoid job hunting dogma. And this, I'm definitely gonna get some no ways out of you. So we'll talk about this more at the workshop, but there is so much non-wisdom out there. There is so much bad advice out there for people that actually tragically hurts their chances to move from career to career. I, I just, I really wanna set the record straight for you guys. It's very hard for HR professionals and recruiters and even hiring managers to give up on these really stupid ideas. So what I want you to do if you're re-careering is don't approach it like a job hunt. Job hunting is something you do when you're on one streamlined career path. You've got a career, you've got a, a degree that's directed toward the career you want, you've got work experience in the company or the field uh, and the skill set uh, that you want to keep doing. And job hunting is what you do when you're just looking for the next natural position along your career path. That's not re-careering. Re-careering is a process where you're gonna grow as a person and you're gonna develop new skills and you're, you're actually taking a left or a right turn first. So I want you to consider the purpose of each step before you take advice on how to do something. So what's the purpose of a resume? Who knows what a resume, what, what's the purpose of a resume? Advertise yourself. Advertise yourself, okay. Anything else? So, so it's a tool. Uh, purpose of a resume is to get a call back. Call back goes well, you get an interview. So what's the purpose of the interview? 
Okay, so the purpose of the interview is to get an offer. Okay, what's the purpose of a job offer? Let's say it's a verbal offer. Exactly. Purpose of a job offer is to enter into a negotiation where you learn about each other's needs and determine how good of a fit it is. Okay, and the end game in a negotiation is to have the discussion converge on a job situation and a salary and compensation package that makes sense for both parties. So anything that doesn't follow along this path, any, any piece of advice you get that sounds like it would not serve this purpose, I would throw it away. So here's some of the dogma we're gonna kill. First dogma we're gonna kill is resumes. There's a lot of this crap out there, okay, and I disagree violently with all of it. So, exact length. Who knows how long a resume should be? One page? Anybody else? Not too long. Not too long? <laughs> Two pages? Anybody else? Five pages if you're in government work. Five pages if you're in government work? Well, we know exactly how long a resume should be, right? Wrong. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, a resume, if your resume is targeting a particular job, and you are supporting your case about why you're qualified for that job, and you don't put any extraneous information in the resume that doesn't belong, if you're emphasizing the things that make you sound like a good match and de-emphasizing the things that you don't want to talk about in the interview, the resume is going to be exactly the length it needs to be. Without all those tortured narrow margins and squeezy little fonts and fiddling with the words to use, really small words to try to say what you're saying, that completely takes you out of the process so that the resume comes across as sounding artificial. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, be general. Who's ever gotten this advice? You're willing to do anything. The summary section at the top, oh, I'm just looking for a challenging job with lots of promotion potential, right? So what's the, what do you think the problem is with being too general on a resume about what your goals are? I don't want to discourage anybody. I don't want to tell them that, you know, I only want to do Java programming, whatever. Okay, the problem with that is, is that you don't sound like a good match for anything. And a hiring manager wants to know what you want to do because that hiring manager wants to know you're going to be happy in the role and you're going to stay there. If, you're, if your resume sounds too general, oh yeah, I'm, I'm happy to wash the dishes, sweep the floor and answer the phones, you're not going to sound like a good match for any of their openings. Uh, padding with the buzzwords and acronyms. How many people have added a ton of buzzwords and acronyms in the resume just so it gets matched in a database search? Okay, and got, you did it because someone told you to do it, right? Recruiters told you to do it, right? Okay, all right. So, and this is, an, 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 uh, I'm probably gonna get taken to task for this, but I violently disagree with this. Here's why. Your resume needs to represent what you wanna do for a living, what you think you're qualified to do for a living, and you're gonna target particular jobs. You may not have every qualification, but I had a really bad experience with this myself. Um, the last time I worked with a recruiter, I was, I was interviewing for a VP role um, at a company in El Segundo, and I sent them a PDF because I didn't want them modifying my resume. So you know what they did? They had, the, they had someone type in my resume from scratch, which was quite a task, and then they modified it without telling me, and they put my five-year-old CCNA certification at the top. And, oh shoot, I did that myself. Oh, sorry about that. And I put my five-year-old, they put my five-year-old CCNA certification at the top, and of course, I hadn't done that work in so long. I was interviewing for a vice president position. I hadn't done that work in so long, I wasn't prepared to answer any questions about CCNA stuff. Um, and it, I was just horrified that they would do that for an executive role. And yet they did, and I didn't, I got faced with this first, first time I saw this resume was when I was sitting there in the interview and they started asking me questions about it. So I disagree with this. When you, you, it's very important to put the right buzzwords and acronyms on your resume that will reflect what you're going to do for a living. But group the technology in a way that makes sense. Set up, grep makes sense together, right? Um, it just, don't mix it up and don't do it to please somebody else. Do what is sensible to describe the kind of position that you're looking for and your experience. Uh, here's another piece of wisdom. You need every certification because it makes you much more competitive. You can beat out, if you have three certifications and everybody else only has one, you're gonna, you're gonna beat them out for the job, right? Wrong. Let me ask you guys a question. Can, there, can you have too many certifications? Of course, I sort of gave that away. Why do you say, why, why yes? I heard yes.
of other things he had done. So of course, overqualified right into the trash. So he's saying that you'll look overqualified if you have too many certs. Or that you're just flat out lying. So um, that may, that's a good point, but I'll tell you what, that's not my point. Speaking as a hiring manager, I'll tell you what I look for. I look for the academic bug. The way your certifications and your accomplishments should be in balance, and usually they alternate. So you get a college degree, and you go get your first job, and you do a couple of cool projects with that, and then you go back for your master's degree, right? Or you go back for a certification, and you specialize in something, and then you write a piece of software, you push it out to open source. You've got an alternation between accomplishments and education because this is how engineers work when they're actually challenging themselves. But there are people out there where you, pop, you pull up the resume and they just have cert, 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 college degree. Um, and those are people, and if they don't have any accomplishments to balance it, the hiring managers, you know, what, what are you gonna picture that their role is on the team? Well, they're gonna be the guy that's always getting new certifications. But they're not, they're not moving up in challenges. Um, and they may be good mentors, but if they're not gonna accomplish new things with the information that they're learning, that's not gonna be an engineer for me. Blitz, how many people have sent out a lot of resumes at one time? How many did you send out? Like 30. 30, I hear that number all the time, that's a magic number. You sent out 30, how many calls did you get back? Maybe two or three. Two or three, and were any of them targeted, were they on the spot? What, what do you mean? Well, the, the companies you wanted to work for and the jobs that you wanted. Yeah. I'll take anything. <laughs> okay. So when you're re-careering, the worst thing you can do is blitz the industry with a resume that's not working. So you don't want to send out 30 resumes. You've just saturated the whole industry with a resume that's not getting you calls back. Now, if it's working, you only need to send one. Because how, how many calls back do you need? How many jobs do you need? One. Right? So yeah, you, you, wanna, you, you do want to practice interviewing, and you surely want to interview in more, with more than one company. But the truth is, is you don't need to send out 30 resumes. And you won't. Every resume you send out is going to be customized for the job that you're applying for. Using formulaic section titles. This does not work in the security industry in general. It really doesn't have anything to do with re-careering. Uh, because so many of our qualifications are going to be CTF competitions, um, special publications, uh, uh, community participation. Uh, so when I've helped people re-career in the security field, if they have racked up a lot of qualifications that are unconventional, we group them together because it gives it makes it gives makes it, it makes it more powerful when you have a whole list and when you can show a progression of responsibility. So if you joined a user group five years ago, three years ago you became president, and every year you give a talk, you can, they can, people looking at your resume look at that like it's a job. Because it's showing a progression of responsibility and increasing technical competence. Avoiding employment gaps. So, this is a tough one to handle in the interview, but I, I wanna give you a strategy that will work for you, because we've all been Almost all of us have had issues where we've been laid off, uh, company downsized. I had a company that moved back east, and they'd have paid us all to go with them, but nobody wanted to go live in the land of snow. So what do you do on your resume if you actually didn't work for five months, six months? What do you do? What, uh, what do you do that won't make you look bad, that won't make you look lazy, unmotivated? Education, other qualifications, casual work. On your resume, which is gonna be your strategy for the job interview too, make it sound like you needed exactly that much time to accomplish the process, the change that you were looking for. So I needed five months to decompress from my previous position and to read these 16 books and to write this talk and then to start the process of re-careering again. You can make it sound like it was full and it was natural and it's part of the process of growing. And you know that that actually impresses the manager sitting across the table. This guy doesn't just sit on his tush. You know, he's got a personal plan and he executes and now he's sitting in front of me with a good looking resume. You just turn that liability of an employment gap into a plus. Self-descriptions. Oh. So the resume that says, I'm a highly motivated self-starter, uh, competitive top achiever, uh, visionary thinker. 
not only do self-aggrandizing statements not persuade me that you're any of those things, they actually are very distracting. You, the content in your resume is what is going to impress me with what you are. If you say that you are highly motivated on your resume, then there better be evidence under it that shows, oh, I, I started working for this company within six months, I had my first promotion. I mean, you can make statements like that if you want, but there better be facts to back it up. So there's actually no point in labeling yourself. Everyone exaggerates. Okay, this is my number one pet peeve about resume development. And how many people have exaggerated on their resume? Actually, don't tell me. We don't want to know. <laughs> Shame on you. So here's the thing. So uh, here's the thing, is that um, some people feel that they're not going to get a job if they don't exaggerate because they're competing with other people that are lying on their resumes. If, they, if, you, if you've patched 10 servers, say you patched 30. If you got 1,000 hits a day, say that it was 2,000 hits a day, right? Um, this is a really stupid strategy if you're recurring because you're going to be sitting across the table from an expert in a job interview who's going to unravel that in about two shakes. But it's not, it's not just because that's a stupid idea and you might be caught fibbing. You shouldn't have to. If you feel like you need to exaggerate in order to sound qualified for a role, you haven't done the recurring process yet. You haven't finished getting your unconventional qualifications, doing your studying, creating your resume, um, practicing your 30-second responses in an interview. That, you're not self-confident enough for it yet. Don't go on interviews until you know you don't have to exaggerate. The best thing to have in a resume is numbers to back up any claim you make. New resume rules. We covered most of this. This is mostly for people that are just reading the slides later. Let's see if I missed anything. Uh, resume development is a process, with a process with a purpose. The purpose of your resume is to get a call back, right? Um, and it serves as a table of contents, a kind of agenda for that phone call or for your job interview. Um, the master resume technique is something I want everybody in this room to do. <laughs> you can't walk out of here without me insisting that from now on going forward, you are not gonna write boring resumes that are book reports. Book report resume is the worst thing in the world. It, they're horrible, they're hard to read, they've got too much information that doesn't mean anything to me, and it means that you aren't laser focused on what it is you wanna do next. Um, so the, what the master resume is, that's where you dump everything. All the way back to when you had a paper route when you were 16 years old. Everything, every, all of your job experience, all of your accomplishments, some little award you got. Um, put it all in a master resume. No one is ever going to see that master resume except you. And a master resume is powerful because in the process of trying to remember all of these things you did before, you suddenly start realizing, oh my goodness, I am really qualified to re-career. I'm finding all this leadership experience I had. I never realized I understand more about sales than I thought. You know, um, and so developing a master resume is a very important process. That's your book report. Now, once you have a master resume, the process is, is you pick out a job posting from a, from a company that you want to target. Pull, go on the net. Go to a careers page, pull up a job posting. There'll be a whole list of requirements. Now, some hiring manager sweat bullets over that. Probably sounds like very cookie cutter. The HR department's gonna want you to check off every box. But if you're re-careering, you're not gonna be a slam dunk. You're not gonna go check, 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 check. You're gonna have, instead of the, your four-year fine arts degree, it's not really gonna mean anything. But your six years of experience will. So for every requirement they have, your resume needs to respond to that. Don't make the hiring manager work for it. So for everything that's in the job posting, you pull entries out of your master resume and put it in a targeted resume that answers it. Now when you go into the job interview, they ask the question, the answer's right in front. It even, even, even reminded yourself. Oh, I wanted to mention that, uh, that I, um, uh, I contributed to an open source project two years ago and it involved this exact technology. Okay, um, the certs and accomplishment balance we talked about, essay approach. So in order to avoid your resume looking like a book report and in order for it to make the case that you need it to make, 
to get the job offer that you're looking for, I recommend you use essay format. Okay, everybody learned how to write essays in high school, right? What's the first thing that goes at the top of an essay? Your name. Okay, it wasn't a trick question. The first thing that goes at the top of the essay is the topic sentence, right? That's a thesis statement that you're trying to prove. And everything else that's under that is supposed to prove your thesis statement, right? So what goes at the top of a good resume? This is my next job, what I want to do next. I want to do penetration testing for a company in the pharmaceutical industry, okay? It goes right at the top. Talk about the environment you want to work in, anything special about the situation you need, uh, the kinds of challenges you're looking for, the role on the team. I'd like a junior role where there's a lot of mentoring available. Put that right at the top if it's important to you. Now, everything underneath that in your resume, everything especially that's emphasized, is going to prove that. So then you go into every job description that you have and you pull out from your master resume ways that you prove you're qualified for that. Okay, so if you were a bookkeeper in the medical industry and you've got HIPAA training, put that on there, right? So you keep pulling out things from all your previous jobs that show that you're qualified for it and it comes out like an essay. By the time the hiring manager is done reading it, there's a very subliminal message that you're absolutely perfect for the role. And not only that, it's You've been perfect for the role for years. It's just been building up to that. And that's where the common message comes from. I'll give you an example of a challenge. Um, my, uh, I have four sons. My second son uh, was a computer engineering student. And he was looking at a marketing apprenticeship, and which he wanted very badly. And of course, his resume only had just kind of land support work and he'd done some AV work and things like that. He had worked for me as a consultant uh, doing system administration work. And yet this is a marketing role. So of course we couldn't just send him a resume for the, for, you know, the way it was. Even his coursework didn't apply. But what we did is we, went, we dove into his master resume and in every single previous piece of work experience, paid and unpaid that he had, we found ties into the marketing industry. The most, uh, just small things, you know, whether it was sales or whether he was doing support for them. The very last most stubborn position was when he had worked for me as a consultant where he was doing light database work and some shell scripting and stuff. And what we, what we finally realized is, oh my goodness, I was work for the marketing department. Had absolutely nothing to do with marketing, but we were able to put the word in there. And so in his resume, there is this common thread, marketing, 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 marketing. And at the top, his goal is he wants a marketing apprenticeship. He sounded extraordinarily qualified once we had finished rewriting it. Emphasizing role progressions is a way to make you, you sound qualified when intuitively you might think you are the least qualified possible. So the bigger the change that you are making, the bigger the adjustment that you have to make, the bigger the sales pitch that you have to make to a hiring manager that you're actually qualified for this special job, the more you're going to need to emphasize progressions and responsibility and the ability to change. and That's going to make you sound qualified. So the last time I gave a talk like this, um, a gentleman in the office had a doctorate in geology. He was an accomplished uh, teacher and he said, you know, he, he's not getting calls back. And when he gets calls back, he doesn't get offers, right? And that's because he was so accomplished as a geologist that there was no progression. There was, there was, he'd already topped out, and what he wanted to do, obviously, was something else, something in IT for a living. So I recommended, and this will work for him, that he rewrite his resume and just de-emphasize his geology. You don't take your PhD out, but you emphasize the fact that, well, you know, so I asked him, he had four previous jobs, and one of his previous jobs, he had, he, he, while he was doing his geology work, he had picked up and done some, I don't remember if it was computational work or something, but something that was lightly programming related. And then, so we were able to emphasize in that role, oh, you started out doing one thing and then you picked up IT work. And if you do that for every role, you say, well, I, I started out and within two months, uh, um, they gave me the database password and I was doing all the backups, right? You can talk about progressions in those jobs that aren't on the mark, but the fact that they can demonstrate that you're flexible is a sale. Interview dogma. Okay, here's three things that are wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, and so, People talk about how face-to-face -face is more honest, 
um, that uh, phone interviews can trip you up. Um, to be honest, you'll be ready for a phone interview or an in-person interview once you've written your targeted resume. You just stay on, you just stay on script. Your, re your targeted resume has an answer for everything they're going to ask already because it answered the job description. Um, avoiding sticky issues, don't... In, your preparation will mean you'll never have to avoid anything. Work on 30-second answers instead for every tough question they might ask. You got fired from that job? Why'd you leave that job? Why'd you get let go? If you're not prepared, you know what might sneak out in the middle of an interview? Uh, my boss didn't like me. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, personality conflict. You know, something that's an absolute disaster could sneak out when you're under stress. Especially when you're feeling a little bit insecure because all you really have is a fine arts degree and you're going to be competing against other people with computer science degrees or something. So don't avoid the sticky issues. Come up with a good, reasonable 30-second answer that addresses it head-on and makes you sound like a winner. Feedback is meaningful. So this, is, this is where the HR professionals in the group aren't going to agree with me. But as a hiring manager, I don't know why anybody, anybody thinks that someone won't be honest with you about why they rejected you. Has anybody here ever gone on an interview and not know why they rejected you and then asked later why? And gotten the feedback? So what did they tell you? Okay, too far. That's, so, but, here, but there's something to be learned from this. That's a pretty safe answer, isn't it? You're too far. Well, what if they really didn't think he was very qualified? What if he stammered in the middle of the interview and, uh, and they thought, oh my goodness, he's, he's going to be really hard to work with, right? They, didn't, they don't have a reason to be honest with you if they're not going to hire you. They don't want to hurt your feelings. What if in a couple of years you're some really big hotshot and they want to bring you back in for another interview? They're not going to let you, they're not going to let you walk away with a terrible taste in your mouth. And so recruiters will tell you, oh, I'll go find out, and sometimes they will give feedback. And there, there isn't anything wrong with asking why I was rejected. Just remember that it's probably not going to be honest. That, that you're still, if you're left with like, I, well, you know, gee, I still don't get why they didn't hire me, it's probably because they weren't being honest with you. If that was a safe answer, that's a clue that that wasn't an honest answer. So the new rules, again, this is really for people just watching the video and not listening. But these are good interview guidelines. It has not specific to recareering at all. You interview them. They don't interview you. You are ready to go because your resume is targeted to, to every conversation you're going to have in this interview. So it's time for you to ask them about the role, about the situation. How much mentoring am I going to have? What's your training budget? How many people did you send to training in the past 12 months? When was the last time anybody on your team got a certification? If you're coming into a more junior role, if you're recareering, you're not coming in at the top of the rung. You're coming, you're going to take a step down and come in a little bit lower. It's about opportunity. Don't forget to ask the tough questions about what is the opportunity. If this team has not practiced mentoring in the past, they're not going to start with you. Practicing 30-second responses, we talked about that, especially for the tough questions. It's very important. Don't go negative. Don't complain about your old boss. You need to practice 30-second responses that are positive and that present you as the kind of person who can adapt. Try to see interview as just a task in a recurring project. Some people go on a lot of practice interviews. I don't encourage a lot. It's always good to go on an interview every now and then for a job you don't expect to want because the pressure's off. It's really good practice to talk to people and present your case when your life isn't on the line. Uh, but it is, if you can get to the point where you're just looking at it as a task and take the pressure off, you're actually going to present yourself much more professionally. And I would practice, practice, practice those answers until there's no apology in your voice. Especially when we're recareering, we're coming from another field, we tend to realize that there are limitations in our answers. You know, they, if they want uh, you know, someone with certain kinds of uh, SQL experience and you can't answer any of their questions, you start apologizing. Oh, gee, I'm sorry, I just don't remember. Keep practicing your answers until that doesn't come out. Negotiating dogma, we could do whole talk on negotiating. Uh, the reason I bring it up here is because I just want to acknowledge that all of you have a hard time with negotiating. It's very, it's tough, especially for analytical people, engineers. Um, it's sometimes the most anxiety producing part of looking for a job, and I acknowledge that. Let's kill some of the dogma. Never tell them how much you want. 
Never accept their first offer. Okay, this is normally, actually, very good advice. If you've never been a hiring manager, I'll explain to you why. Okay, so never tell them how much you want, and especially about accepting the first offer. Okay, so um, what happens to candidates is uh, uh, there's, a, there's a range for a role. Let's say the, the, the role pays between 80 and 95 a year, 80 and $95,000 a year. Okay, what is gonna determine what they actually offer you? Anybody know? So how so you that job posting you had that you had to click off the qualifications? If you click if they had eight items and you clicked all eight off and you were a perfect match, they're gonna offer you ninety-five. <laughs> you're gonna get the top end of the spectrum because you're a good match. And you're gonna hit the ground running when you join the team and you're gonna come up to speed a lot faster, so you deserve more money. As a reborn, as somebody who is recareering into this position though, you're by definition, we're kind of creatively showing that we're qualified. We're going we're gonna to probably take a less responsible role than we want now because we want opportunity. Um, normally, when you accept the first offer, you are becoming victim to something that HR departments are instructed to do, and that is to lowball you. Uh, maybe lowball is a little bit harsh, but if the job is, if they're offering 80 to 95, and it would be fair, say, to offer you uh, 90 because you're a pretty good match, they're going to still just maybe offer you 80 or 85 because they expect you to counter. And when you don't counter <laughs> because you're afraid of losing the opportunity or something, here's what happens. Then you get hired in and you're too low. You're the only guy on the team that's not making 90, 95 grand a year. Now you're a problem because this hiring manager now has to spend everybody else's raise money making a salary correction for you in the following raise cycle. So managers absolutely hate this when HR departments do this. So normally I would say don't accept their first offer. Figure out for yourself how well you think you fit in that spectrum and wait for something that comes right where it should land. Uh, except, in the to except in the case of recareering, the first offer might actually be right in the salary range that you need. And if, that, and if that's the case and there's more opportunity, don't emphasize salary. So I just want to mention Investopedia. Um, it, there's less of that here than in Silicon Valley. Uh, but for the people that I've worked with that, um, that work in Silicon Valley, the stock option plans, and the, <laughs> it, just, it gets very, very confusing. Um, and when you first look at the packet, it all sounds wonderful. And then you start reading the sneaky details, and you realize you're getting the shaft. So uh, there is one startup I work for. They converted all of my, com all of my premium stock to common stock, uh, which is um, the equivalent of saying that uh, you, know, you used to be able to vote, you used to have some power, and, and now you're going to be the last person that gets money. So Investopedia is a great resource for explaining terms and, um, and uh, negotiating uh, and, uh, and helping you clarify your negotiating stance. So third item for how to re-career, uh, targeting roles and employers. Um, keep in mind you're gonna have to step back to leap forward. If you're a senior staff engineer and, and you're not in the security world but you wanna move to the security world, you're not gonna move straight into a senior staff engineer as a security engineer. You're gonna to need to step back and step down in responsibility, maybe even down a little bit in salary because we wanna do something new. We wanna do something cool and something challenging um, and we wanna, eventually what we're gonna do is hit warp speed and maybe have a much higher salary opportunity than we had in the past. For most of us that'll probably be the case. But we need to start by stepping back to leap forward. And it's a smart move to make if it lets you focus on learning. Uh, for employers with and without HR, um, some people will say uh, never uh, try not to go work for a large company uh, because they have the they do the, the alphabet soup with the resumes and things like that. That can work for you and against you. Since you're recareering and you're probably working on your certifications, that th those certifications actually with larger companies mean more than college degrees in the security world in most cases. So, uh, for instance, I used to work for a government think tank, and the uh, department manager position for all of IT, they said either they wanted, in, um, either they wanted a master's degree or they wanted um, a CCIE certification. So it was one or the other. Um, and what you can look for is high need employer situations. Uh, if you see a job posting that's been around a long time, that's a good one to respond to. 
So we got some yawns. Let me see if I can skip a few slides here so we can get moving on. Uh, so he, when you, in order to target, um, effectively target the, the uh, companies that you want to work for, there are lots of places you can look at. Um, the one I'll highlight here is, is one called Blind. I've never actually used that. Uh, Blind is special because to sign up for that service, you have to use your corporate email account to sign up. And then you get anonymous access to other people who are employees at the same company. So if you're negotiating with Facebook, and it's a network engineering role, and you want to know what everybody else is making, or what did they get offered, then you can go on this blind site and you can ask them questions. And employees, it's all anonymous. So uh, they can either choose to give you the information or not. But it can really make a big difference in knowing whether you're getting a good offer. So helping help, help recruiters help you. So recruiters don't do everything, right? Uh, you may or may not work with a recruiter. Here's the general rule. If you work with a recruiter and they tell you about a job posting, they deserve the recognition for that. Don't do the end around on that, okay? Now, if you're, if you're on your own and you find a job posting on your own that wasn't recommended through a recruiter, then do your negotiating without them. Uh, there are benefits to working with recruiters because they, do, they will do your negotiating for you. It can take some of the stress out of it. A disadvantage is the bounty that's paid sometimes comes out of what might have been a signing bonus or a per diem for relocating. Um, when you work with recruiters, though, come to the table with a plan. Here's the kinds of companies I want to target. Here's my timeline for starting. Tell me if I need any certifications. Don't just go say, help, send me some job postings, right? You need to have a plan. Be clear about what you don't want. If you want a telecommute, if you don't want a seven-day-a-week job, if you don't want to do on-call duty, if you don't want to be the senior guy in a team that's in charge of uh, more junior personnel, make that very, very clear so that they won't waste your time. Give them after interview feedback. Let them know how you think the interview went. Uh, let's see. How lugs can help uh, people. Uh, do your local user groups, I don't know if how many of you guys engage in local user groups, do they, do they start off the meeting by saying, has anybody uh, got a job posting? Has anybody got a position on their team? Well, that's one of the handiest things about local user groups. Um, Meetup.com has a local user groups. So if you're looking for a job and you don't know where to start, go to these local user groups and at the, before the meeting starts, let everybody know that you're looking for a role. And if you're here, you know that conferences can help. Um, as was mentioned yesterday in the jobs uh, panel, smaller conferences have more helpful mentoring, uh, but larger conferences have more resources. So like our smaller conference here, we tried to do the best of both worlds at ShellCon. So scale, our attendance is over 3,000. Uh, we have one or two jobs boards. We have a jobs boff, which is often attended by more than 100 people. Um, and at the expo halls, at the larger cons, they may have rows and rows of sponsor tables. And you can just bring a stack of resumes. I caution you, though, be very careful that you only give them targeted resumes. Uh, but you can, it's a very efficient way to meet uh, HR groups. Oh, um, so uh, uh, raise me. So where this comes from is that um, I'm recareering, and, and I want to share this with you. But with that, all the skills gap, uh, with, the, um, with the jobs gap in the security industry, it's crazy to me and our other friends at Raise Me uh, at ShellCon, uh, how many people, how many friends in our peer group were looking for jobs and they were stuck? They would say, oh, I've been looking for something for three months. And you, There's so many jobs out there. Are you kidding me? So there, it just, it's, it's unthinkable to me that there's this huge gap in such a well-compensated industry that's so interesting to work in and people are still complaining they can't get jobs. So when we develop ShellCon, uh, one major aspect of it is what we call Raise Me and that's a career development aspect. We wanted to help. So our Raise Me effort, which we, kinda, we, which we hope will spread to other conferences, um, it's not just job hunting. So if your management wants to pay for you to attend a conference, it's not just job hunting. It's career development, it's training, it's talks like this uh, where we're trying to mentor other leaders. And... Uh, now it's time for recruiting outreach. Oh, um, 
yes. So do we have, who's, who's hiring? Okay, you wanna give your thing? You wanna stand up and talk? Uh, sure. Sure, you can turn it off now. How, how broad of a discussion do you want me to have? Uh, <laughs> 60 seconds. Okay, so uh, my name's Tony. I'm the director of security at Tinder. Uh, our security team is about two and a half years old now, and we have uh, multiple positions available. Our team's broken down into privacy, governance, regulation, and compliance, monitoring and incident response, application security, and infrastructure security. Uh, currently, we're hiring for infrastructure security, which is basically IT security, our networks and endpoints, things in the office, that sort of thing, uh, SaaS applications. Um, monitoring and incident response was basis of your general forensics, watching, watching the wires, looking for alerts, those sorts of things. Um, if you have skills and experience with log aggreg aggregation technologies like Splunk and ArcSight, those sorts of things, ELK. Um, and then we're also hiring for governance, regulation, compliance, which is PCI, SOX, and uh, a little bit of GDPR, doing vendor reviews and things like that. Um, I don't know how much more you want <laughs> me to spend. Uh, I agree with much of what you said. Obviously, everybody has difference of opinions on certain things. Um, we have the full range of people on our team. Um, we have people who are fresh out of college, um, and they have a, like they went to a really good cybersecurity program, um, RIT or something like that. Um, and we have people who are uh, former network engineers who transitioned over, for former systems administrator uh, administrators who turn uh, who um, transferred over. And then we have people who've been doing, uh, we have some people who are doing one type of security and moved into another type of security. Um, so we kind of have the full gamut on our team. Um, if you have any questions, you know, there, we have uh, job descriptions on the table out there. Oh, actually, they've been relocated here, apparently. Oh, there's, there's At least a few of them, yeah. Um, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me directly as well while I'm here. About does it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it, it would be positional, uh, positionally specific. Notice you have three positions and one has like a couple of on it. Yeah, so, okay, so sorry. The, uh, the question was is which certifications are respected the most. Um, so my view on certifications is they're a value add. Like if you don't have any experience but you have certifications, it helps to get your foot in the door, but they don't carry a ton of weight because there's so many certification mills and brain dumps and things like that where people aren't really getting the, the learning experience out of the, the program that, that's intended. Um, there's some that, uh, I don't wanna bash any, but um, there's some lower entry level ones where you read through the material yourself and you're like, this is just wrong. <laughs> like they, they're teaching bad things in this material and, and, and those sorts of things. So um, for application security or, or actually for, for red teaming pen testers, the OSCP, um, is usually one that's pretty well respected because it's actually very practical and it's a lot of work and it walks you through a lot of things you'd have to do in real life as a pen tester. Um, beyond that, it, you know, uh, the GRC roles have like the SISM and all those different, she had a bunch of them up there. Um, the CISSP is kind of like your basic borderline one, but I mean, uh, it's almost a joke at times. Like people laugh about how it's, it's a, a an inch deep and a mile wide, so it, it covers too much. So um, I think the the best the best way to sum it up is just that experience is is better than any piece of paper, right? If you can if you've done it before and I and you can confidently convey that in an interview, I think that's way better than having a certification. But they do help if you're starting from ground zero, right? Um, as I progress through my career, you know, when I was doing sysadmin work, I would chase. Uh, whatever sysadmin certs, and then I try to do network engineer, I, I would do it too because it always helped me get to that next step, especially if I was trying to change roles. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh. Uh, my name is David Rhodes. I'm a partner in a company called Overflow Technical Services. We do um, pretty much straight IT work, so we're not looking so much for security specialists, but for those of you that have a background in the IT world that just want to pick up some ad hoc work, we actually work a great deal with contractors, and I am looking for some system engineer level contractors that we can work with in the San Gabriel Valley, San Fernando Valley, and Los Angeles Basin. So if you guys just every once in a while want to pick up a job, um, just do some quick work, a network build or a network fix, 
um, please either give me a business card or come get one of mine and let's talk. Okay? And I've been around and will be around for, uh, for a little bit. If you don't have any cards, I actually have uh, something we use at ShellCon. It's like a blank business card uh, that you can use to put your name and contact information and a reason uh, why you should contact each other. And you can hand these out. There's a whole stack here if you'd like to take some. It's especially tacky to use your current business card to look for new work, guys. <laughs> uh, we also have stickers. These are prime. We got ShellCon stickers. And I have Raise Me stickers. So anyway, you're welcome to it. What's your question? Oh, sure. Okay, can yeah. I? Uh, sorry, I wasn't prepared, but I would like to take this opportunity. My name is Signan. I'm a platform engineer in Cloudflare. Do you guys know about Cloudflare? Yeah, so uh, for security roles, we actually have a very wide, uh, many positions in different areas. So to, and we have pretty much interesting scales. So we have 150 data centers across the world more than 5,000 servers to manage. We process 10% of the internet traffic. And basically, we have many departments where we need security specialists. So we, uh, pure engineering department, we have many products. And so, so we're not only the, we like to think ourselves not only a CDN business, but we're a security company. We do a lot of products for our customers and security base, so we actually need security engineering, both high level and low level. Also, we have, uh, since we have a big infrastructure, we have hit many challenges in infrastructure security, so I'm mostly working on that. And also, we have our own in pure infosec department, if you're into, like, more offensive side or penetration testing of our own network, application vulnerability research, helping our engineering team to protect like our customers' data across our network, like WAF rules and everything like that. So there is tons of opportunity. Please, please check our careers page. Talk to me if you find me. I'll tell more details. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Oh, you have a job opening. How's it going? Um, my name is Marcus. I work at a company called Somerset Recon. We primarily focus on penetration testing, a lot of uh, hardware embedded security analysis, also like IoT. So you commonly see, uh, you know, a hardware component mixed in with a mobile app, a web app, kind of uh, the whole gamut. So those are prim primarily the most uh, common things we see. Uh, we also do a lot of reverse engineering, um, you know, vulnerability analysis and stuff like that. So. If you know how to get your hands dirty with Ida Pro, or if you know um, how to, you know, desolder a chip, dump flash, all that kind of stuff, that's stuff we're doing. So, if you're interested, uh, SomersetRecon.com, or just come find me. Usually in the CTF Village. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Oh. This is Miss Marissa. HR extraordinaire. Oh. <laughs> Hi, my name is Marissa, and I work for Synergistic. We're a publicly traded security consulting firm exclusive to healthcare. We provide security, compliance, privacy, managed print, and remediation services. I'm hiring right now a security consultant for a remediation project based in New Jersey. Our positions are remote with travel. We also have a security engineer position open and Basically, if you're open to travel and you have great soft skills, you like working with people, and if you have experience as an IT director or manager or you're a security analyst, those are great places to start, or if you are a consultant already. Uh, we also have a more technical role uh, for Cisco ICE implementation uh, position based in Northern California, but largely remote. So let me know if you have any questions. Anybody else? Okay, so now this is time for uh, the resume workshop. Actually, Marissa pointed out that um, a lot of the information I'm giving for the resume you can implement on your own, although we can help you get through the snags if you've got especially hard verbiage to work on. But she thinks that interviewing practice would be probably a really good investment. So I guess we're all pretty hopeless. Anyway, so um, we'll, we'll do the first exercise with resumes. Uh, did anybody bring a resume? Hard copy? 
One, no, don't have hard copy. Two, anybody else? Okay, so um, turn that off. We're done. Thank you. <laughs>